Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what we are doing uh, to run Kubernetes, which is a container cluster management software, uh, and how we are wanting to deploy it on our OpenStack infrastructure. So my name is Ashwin Ravindran, and I work for eBay Cloud Engineering Group. I uh, joined the group about uh, four and a half years and have been involved in various uh, infrastructural cloud <coughs> uh, platforms, including OpenStack, some home ground, and currently I'm leading this effort uh, to operationalize Kubernetes. So uh, before we jump into Kubernetes, just want to know like, if anyone uh, has used Kubernetes in scale or you know, used it at all, heard about it? Uh, okay. So um, Kubernetes is a, a cluster management uh, platform. Um, it is from backed by Google. Uh, it's based out of their Borg uh, system, which powers most of uh, the Google workloads. So the way uh, Google um, operates their infrastructure is not uh, by directly exposing the developers or applications to their infrastructure, but abstracting it out. And they use containers um, as the main mechanism for that. But um, uh, basically, like in these, these applications are now you know, termed as cloud native. The idea is that you package your application not just as an application binary, but you include the whole ecosystem surrounding it, you know, all your uh, system libraries, anything which uh, your application requires uh, to finally be run in production, you package it together. So this in itself is like pretty powerful because as you know like from all the uh, frenzy happening around the container space, like, you know, there's lots of things which are happening. I mean, it's really cool for application developers. But the interesting aspect for us is like, you know, how you take this uh, unit and deploy it all the way uh, to your different environments, like you know, be it in development, uh, your testing and production, you don't change anything. You know, you get the exact same uh, packaging all the way through. And having something like a, a cluster management solution allows you to, you know, um, takes your uh, hands off in having to manage this application. So Kubernetes provides some first-class constructs with which you can actually uh, define your application's, uh, you know, runtime needs. And then uh, from that time onwards, like, you know, Kubernetes take care of uh, managing it. So stuff like an application failure or a not failure is like automatically handled. Um, uh, so there are like certain constructs on top of like, you know, your uh, container runtime, which Kubernetes provides for you to do that. So one of the first thing is like the, the concept of a pod. Uh, a pod is a collection of containers. So you, instead of just writing uh, one container, which normally is representing a process, a single process of your application, you compose your application into a collection of containers, each running a single process. For example, your Java process may be like you know, one container, your log shipper may be another one, and you, know, you would have like a monitoring and other aspects of it, which are all packaged as different containers, and this whole group is called a pod. This pod is uh, the, the unit of deployment in Kubernetes. So you either uh, deploy a pod or not. You don't independently uh, uh, deploy your containers. So this model of having a collection of containers allows like, framework providers like us you know, to inject our specific uh, you know, uh, uh, application uh, bits into that. For example, we have a group which actually uh, does log analysis, log shipping. So they can independently write their containers and any application group, regardless of the application stack they use, uh, it could be Java, it could be you know, Go, it could be you know, Python, they can, when they want to use their log shipping uh, bit, can use this container and then deploy. Uh, because of the abstractions which Kubernetes provide, you uh, mentioned, uh, instead of saying that, hey, I want to statically like, you know, provision this container on a box and then you know, have some other system manage it, in Kubernetes, Kubernetes you say that this is uh, my application, um, you know, and I want like you know, ten copies of that. You know, please run it. And oh, by the way, like I, I want, I'm exposing like you know, these five services. You know, please make it available on the cluster. So when you declare this intent to the system, all these things are realized by the by the Kubernetes uh, cluster management, and your service registry is automatically populated, and all the service endpoints of all the applications running in the uh, cluster is made available to everyone to use. So we are moving straight from like an infrastructural uh, world like where you know folks are having to deploy you know vms and you know dealing with the coarse abstraction to fine grain application level abstractions which are continuously monitored and managed and application groups do not have to reinvent the wheel of figuring out different ways of dealing with their applications the entire life cycle including the you know the the rollouts of the new code and management all the aspects are managed uh, automatically so 
this is like you know really good for building microservices kind of application where you don't have like big monolithic applications. Instead, you have uh, those big monoliths broken down into smaller services, each having their own distributed uh, you know requirements. So all like if you have like tens of uh, thousands of these things, it's an impossible thing to manage all of them like individually. Uh, in, in our organization, there are different groups managing different stuff. There are front-end facing folks. There are like in you know, a back-end uh, database, um, you know, op, uh, groups. We want to unify all the the, the deployment uh, mechanism for all of these, and that's where Kubernetes is going to be uh, useful. We think. And as you was, uh, it was earlier mentioned um, in FICO, like you know, you're using OpenShift, like you know, um, but Kubernetes is the you know the the base on which you, uh, OpenShift is built. So it's a, actually a cool stuff. So roughly, this is the architecture Kubernetes has. It's a fairly uh, simple system uh, design. Uh, you have uh, uh, um, sorry, you have a, 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 a master node, uh, which is like you know where the, the the primary components are running. Like you know those include your API server and a bunch of schedulers. So these API servers are the ones uh, to which uh, your application developers interact. They interact by uh, uh, declaring their intent um, for running their application. Application, as I mentioned, are packaged as operating system containers, and your scheduler um, decides where to place them onto a cluster of nodes. And each of the, the minion nodes, or the, the, the worker nodes, have a process uh, uh, which is owned by Kubernetes, and it's called Kubelet. So Kubelet is the place where we can hook in different plugin points. Also, there are different controllers you can hook in uh, to the master process to do your own scheduling, your own network, what not. So uh, the, the, the talk, uh, actually, I'm going uh, I'm, I'm to be focusing on what we have done um, in writing those plugins so that it could run on OpenStack, leveraging most of OpenStack features because we are heavily invested on OpenStack. So all those things, like you know, uh, all the Kubernetes diagram, like you know, uh, the, the design, we want to make it run on uh, OpenStack using all the OpenStack components. So there are like, you know, these work streams which are specifically uh, dealing with uh, our integration points with OpenStack, so I'll talk uh, you know, on each of those. So networking is like the uh, the first area, like which is probably like you know the I would say like the one of the complex aspects of having uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, because of the need that every pod, which I said is an deployment unit, requires uh, IP. So this is kind of uh, tough, uh, you know, if you think about it, because uh, in OpenStack every VM gets an IP, but we are going to run multiple multiple pods inside a VM. So in each of those pods should have a routable IP. So how do you do that you know, in an OpenStack environment? Not just that, like, you know, in OpenStack, uh, in, in, in Kubernetes, the, the requirement is that each node not just gets an IP, but a block of IPs, a serial block. So every pod which is like, you know, coming inside a node gets an IP from this serial block. So we have to somehow be able to route to that uh, particular VM a block of IPs. In clouds like Google, it's pretty simple. They have you know, uh, the cloud supporting that. I can say, hey, I want to route this particular a block of IPs to the, the host, and you know it, it gets done. On OpenStack, like you know, we have to figure out something else. Another aspect of uh, any networking solution is like the performance and the manageability aspect of it. We run like uh, a fairly large uh, uh, open uh, you know uh, SDN solution, um, overlay based, and uh, there are like you know, issues when we get to some scale. But you know, we, over the years, like we have uh, gotten to a manageable state. But um, if you look at most of the Kubernetes solution out there, there are like native networking um, stacks which are built upon uh, on uh, Kubernetes. So that is the default option we get. But uh, you know, um, considering the maturity of that, we did not want to like you know, use any of those. So the way um, we did like you know solve these things are by creating the, the, the following uh, for the independent IPs per uh, pod. We actually did. We created like a private network uh, space just for uh, Kubernetes. So we would have like the VMs uh, having their own network uh, IPs, and then we would create uh, one pri per cluster one network uh, space, and each uh, each of the parts would come from uh, that network space. And uh, to satisfy the requirement of having one SIDL block, what we did was we created like one neutron subnet, a uh, neutron uh, a neutron network, and a subnet per node. As you some of you would know, like a neutron network roughly uh, is analogous to a layer two domain. So this actually helps a little bit because you know for each of our nodes we have a small layer two domain. All the traffic you know which are on that particular subnet stays resident within the box. 
in our um, uh, re, uh, in our uh, deployment we have uh, this capability for distributed routers so i mean uh, that actually kind of helps in distributing the load pretty evenly without having any uh, uh, penalties but depending on the network plugin you use you may or may not be able to uh, use the solution but it works per uh, perfectly fine for our solution so what we are uh, also uh, doing is like we are using our native SDN. We are not building any other uh, solution on top of Kubernetes. All we are doing is uh, the, uh, the architecture you know, roughly looks like, looks like uh, this. Like we have a, a Kubernetes router. And each, uh, as I said, like in each node gets its own network. What we do is like we simply bridge that network into the host, uh, uh, the, the container bridge. And then all the uh, uh, parts come up in that bridge. We uh, wrote a plugin, uh, a Kubernetes plugin, which actually takes up, uh, which does like uh, IP allocation and in, uh, route injection to the containers uh, when they come up. So this way, like you know, we don't need, um, we can still leverage the OpenStack network support by just like, writing like a few uh, extra uh, bits. There are other complexities, like you know, prior to Docker 1.6 network. Uh, was not very uh, pluggable, so we had to do you know a, a little bit of uh, uh, crazy stuff like you know to make it uh, all work. But uh, with, uh, post 1.7, I think like you know we have uh, default support from Docker for networking, so uh, we are planning to rewrite that uh, bits so that you know it works natively. Um, the future of networking for our uh, our side like you know we want to uh, consider moving to a pure layer three networking with BGP support and stuff like that. Uh, we are also working on a, a policy-based distributed firewall. Um, so instead of uh, having network-defined uh, isolation boundaries, we are actually uh, going with implementing something of our own, leveraging, let's say, IP uh, tables or other mechanisms to isolate traffic uh, on a pure layer three routed fabric. Um, IP space exhaustion is another thing which we are dealing with. So we are actively looking at IPv6. Um, I wouldn't say like active. We are looking at IPv6 uh, as a potential option of getting out of that. Since Docker now supports IPv6, that's a good thing. So another uh, aspect is IAM. Uh, like any other you know, uh, respectable software, Kubernetes also requires identity and access management. Uh, since we already are you know, having a good deployment, so we are going to use Keystone uh, uh, to provide all the support. Um, in Cube, we have this uh, Kubernetes, we have this uh, construct of a namespace. Uh, so you are exposed to a, like a large cluster in Kubernetes. For every application can define their own namespaces, which are a unit of control. So we want to map that namespaces back to a Keystone project. So in, in order to get an IAM access, all that user has to do is like, you know, go to a Keystone, um, create a project, add his roles, and you know, uh, we would have a, our plugins would take care of like, you know, using that information to uh, allow API access uh, to Kubernetes. So roughly it looks like this. Uh, as I mentioned, um, the user out of the band goes to the Keystone, gets a, you know, creates all the users and roles, and he gets a token before he interacts with the Kubernetes system. And then he uh, makes a call, and you know our plugin validates that. Um, the future, so we want to move uh, a bit into like you know attribute-based access control, uh, and we want to like uh, have the whole thing based out of a policy. And right now, uh, Kubernetes like use a, a, a tool, a client-side tool with which you interact with the cluster. It's called kubectl. We want to interface. Uh, we want to um, imp uh, inject like this uh, IAM flow into that. So that's another thing which we want to work on. And um, generally, we have like a, a, a need for a, a pervasive IAM solution. Um, and we are actually working with the community on that. There are some neat ideas there to uh, go after. So storage is another aspect. Like, you know, I heard it mentioned that you know, it's, it's kind of quite hard uh, to have stateful uh, workloads uh, run on a container uh, system. So the way we solve it is like by uh, leveraging OpenStack Cinder. We wrote a plugin again, uh, which allows uh, Cinder to be automatically plugged in into a container space. This is pretty uh, interesting in that when you declare your pod, you can also specify uh, uh, your uh, need for a persistent uh, device. Uh, the cube the installation the Q and the cube plugins we have actually makes out a call into Cinder, uh, gets you a block storage, automatically mounts it on the box, and then uh, exposes, it, exposes it onto a, your file system tree after formatting into the uh, right file system uh, type. So you get, you know, uh, when, when your uh, pod comes up, you get, you know, your Cinder volume mounted on that. And the good, another good part is like on a node death, like if your node on which your container dies, 
our plugins would automatically detect that and remount the pod elsewhere and you know uh, loads it up there so you know you you get your persistent storage to move around uh, with you with your pod so uh, roughly the there are like you know, a couple of uh, kubernetes like in you know, specific constructs there um, they they have uh, the idea the idea of creating a few sets of uh, pre create a few sets of uh, uh, volumes ahead of the time and the folks who are using that have to make a claim uh, on using that. So that is represented in this diagram. So the admins actually pre-create uh, certain volumes of certain sizes, and the users claim those, and we take care of the rest. We actually you know, move uh, the pods wherever we go, uh, wherever the pod goes, actually. So this is all like, you know, transparent to the user, by the way. Um, so uh, the, the, some of the future directions we want to look at is like you know, go with some native distributed storage. Ceph is like a, a contender, and we're also like you know, working on uh, Swift-based storage sidecars. As I mentioned earlier, the way Kubernetes works is by assembling a bunch of parts. So and each of these parts, uh, each of the containers in the parts share a lot of uh, network resources, you know, your mount namespaces and stuff like that. So what we can use uh, for doing um, something cool is to have your primary application container write to a common location, which is watched by a companion uh, container on your pod, and that actually can sync it back with uh, uh, Swift. So without uh, the application having to know anything about Swift, you can get the Swift support. So that's the same thing. Like you know, um, if you look at uh, most of the deployment uh, uh, and, and, and the usage patterns, Kubernetes ex uh, kind of abstracts most of the uh, uh, the infrastructural details from the user. You are only dealing with your containers, your persistent storage. All of them are like you know, automatically exposed to your runtime. So we want to like you know, continue that. Um, so this is another idea, the cluster setup and management we spend a lot of time on. Like, you know, we are not using the Magnum project yet uh, for various reasons. So uh, we had to actually like, you know, write the whole uh, cluster uh, setup uh, scripts ourselves. And we are using um, you know, OpenStack APIs, Cloud and Salt Stack you know, to uh, do this thing. We are also, uh, since we want to like, you know, em uh, embark on this journey of having immu immutable infrastructure all the way uh, to the uh, stack, we are actually uh, investing on uh, something, you know, uh, using this disk image builder based pipeline, where even the container uh, uh, VM, the VM host, like w is built using a declarative manifest, and disk image builder is the one which is uh, building it out of that. And every single thing uh, where we have any uh, non dockerized build artifacts, which we hope should be like you know less and less as we go for, um, are all stored on Sift now. So Sift is like a very key component of our uh, stack. So this is like you know uh, there's a lot of uh, stuff in our um, uh, future roadmap for cl uh, cl uh, cluster setup. We want to have a multi-provider uh, cluster setup uh, capability. So think of Magnum, but for any other uh, clouds, and it has to be declarative, just like Kubernetes is. It's a declarative system. Uh, we also want to like you know uh, use this uh, thing to uh, go to the next uh, uh, step of the journey where we have federated clusters, uh, which can so it's it's basically a Kubernetes which is running federated across multiple cloud providers. Another uh, uh, aspect of our work has been to create a container registry. Um, so again, this requires an access control. So we used Keystone again for you know uh, this purpose, and for the storage we used uh, uh, Swift. So all the uh, images which are storing into your Docker container registry actually goes into a Swift. Um, there's again, you know, the notary support where we have to uh, ensure the images we are building out are like all, you know, uh, done by the right folks. Uh, so the notary support, which is we just got announced, like you know, uh, in 1.7, we are planning to use that, and of course, scale and other aspects will follow. So that's uh, you know. Um, Kind of an overview of like uh, where we are. So the journey started about six, seven months ago, and you know we have few clusters which we are uh, running uh, inside. They are all uh, on the experimental basis. Uh, we are planning to go uh, to take some uh, small production workloads in the next uh, two months. Um, again, like you know, there are lots of works to be done. All that I just mentioned was about you know where we had to interact with OpenStack, but beyond that, there were like many others. Um, but uh, as I said, like you know, this is a very exciting journey. We are just starting, and uh, we, if there are anyone who is interested, you know, please let us know. We can share uh, our you know, passion to making something really good uh, come out of this. Thank you. Thanks, Ashwin.